Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for coming out uh, today for our inaugural Lunch with the Scientist program, the, the very first one, and we're so pleased that uh, you've made it out today. I'm Dennis Bartels, the executive director of the Exploratorium, um, and it's really my honor to welcome you and to introduce these incredible people here behind me. Um, we've now been in this amazing new space for a little over the year. Uh, and we have seen um, nearly 1.2 million visitors, more than two times the number uh, that we ever saw uh, at the Palace of Fine Arts. Um, we, our building a few months ago was just declared platinum lead, um, which was wonderful <laughs> uh, to learn. Uh, we've seen about four times as many family memberships um, we've seen, uh, in fact, twice as many of our teachers already being served as we were able to in the old place. Uh, and finally, one of the things I'm, I'm very excited about, uh, we're seeing about 30% more school field trips this spring than we had guessed. Uh, and there's an interesting reason why that's true. Uh, it turns out that we thought the constraining factor would be the fact that we only have a curb cut big enough in front of Pier 17 to handle four buses at a time. But we found out that nearly half of our school field trips are coming by public transportation. Um, so yes, we're becoming a little bit like New York City, where you see school kids in, in uh, same uniforms or t-shirts or caps running up and down the Embarcadero between uh, 10 and 11 uh, in, in the afternoon. And so we're so excited about the uh, response that we've received. Um, but most importantly, I mean, I think this whole project um, and our new campus is really allowing us to sort of multiply our impact um, in helping truly um, for all of us to see the world a little bit differently um, and to really see human learning um, in a new light uh, and in a way that we think is much more robust um, for all uh, human beings. Um, and so it's sort of continuing that original vision that our founder, Frank Oppenheimer, had. Um, and as programs um, like today, uh, that this facility and this incredible room here allows us to have, uh, and in particular to showcase um, the new kinds of partnerships, commercial, industrial, academic, um, that we've been uh, gaining by virtue of our new address and the visibility that we have in the community. Um, and today, it's not uh, insignificant for our inaugural luncheon um, that we feature the world famous Gladstone Institute. Um, you know, one of the leading edge institutes here, uh, right at the Mission Bay campus, uh, affiliated with UC San Francisco but uh, doing its own incredible, um, really, uh, breakthrough work. Uh, and so you're in for a real treat today to hear a little bit about the program there. Um, and also um, to uh, be introduced to one of our um, most formidable board members. So I'm honored to introduce this incredible group behind me. It includes our host, Sandy Williams, uh, who is the uh, president of the Gladstone Institutes and also an exploratorium board member. Sandy? Um, it's also um, a pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Uh, Yu Dong Wang, uh, Gladstone Institute research scientist and a leader in the field of developing treatments for Alzheimer's, um, which as you know, regenerative medicine is one of the, the uh, cornerstones for the Gladstone Institute. And finally, to introduce our own Dr. Christina Yu, uh, the Exploratorium Senior Scientist and the Chief Curator of our Living Systems Gallery, uh, the gallery right there at the end uh, on the east, uh, looking at the bay. So uh, please join me in welcoming this uh, incredible group. And Christina, I'll let you take it from here. The mic is on, excellent. So um, thanks again for joining us. I'm really excited to have um, Sandy and Yadong here. The Gladstone Institute has been um, a great friend and a collaborator of the Exploratoriums for a number of years. Um, and so we're really excited to um, allow you some insight into the great science that's happening. Um, Dr. Yadong Huang um, is working on Alzheimer's, as Dennis mentioned, and he's also pioneering a lot of really groundbreaking stem cell technologies uh, to answer questions about Alzheimer's. And so um, I'd like to invite Dr. Wang to um, maybe give us an overview of his work and um, let us know what are the questions that you're trying to answer with this um, extraordinary work that you and your team are doing at the Gladstone. Yeah, um, first, uh, good afternoon. It's a really a great pleasure 
uh, to be here to you know uh, talk with you guys and then share our research experience on both uh, Alzheimer disease, which as you know is one of the terrible diseases that cause a lot of problem. Currently, it would be even more dramatic if there we couldn't develop any treatment for the next 10 or, or 20 years or so. And secondly, also share some research experience on the uh, stem cell biology or stem, sci uh, stem cell uh, uh, drug development related stem cell uh, aspect or the uh, stem cell therapy, potential therapy in the future. Uh, again, it's a really great pleasure here. So the, the, the two major parts in my laboratory at Glassstone uh, one is, as you, you just mentioned, about Alzheimer's disease research. As uh, all you know, currently Alzheimer's disease is uh, the number uh, the six uh, uh, disease that caused the death in, in, in this country and also worldwide. has currently about 5.2 million Americans suffering from this uh, disease. And it costs about $200 million each year uh, um, based on the number published last year. It's predicted, you know, in, in about 40 years or so, if there's no any treatment, will be threefold more uh, increase only in this country. Uh, will be reaching about 150 million in the world while for this disease. The cost will reach about a trillion dollars. So, um, so we face this uh, uh, clearly is a, a major problem uh, now. So one of the research focus in my laboratory tried to understand what causes Alzheimer's disease. Uh, based on the understanding, can we develop any treatment that can either uh, slow down the disease or even uh, uh, you know, cure the disease? Uh, we are using animal models, cell cultures, and in collaboration with some clinicians in UCSF and in other medical centers, try to also study uh, uh, some human uh, samples. Um, in parallel, especially based on the few recent few years, uh, um, a big um, biological breakthrough, that's the stem cell biology, as you all know, you know, the Shian Yamanaka's work, uh, you know, reprogram skin cells or uh, somatic cells into uh, uh, stem cells. So we are also working on the stem cell biology focusing on three areas. One is try to uh, model the disease in a dish. So like Alzheimer's disease, it's hard to get human you know, brain cells in, in culture because nobody will really don donate <laughs> these type of cells. So what we are doing now is just what we can do, it take skin cells, basically any type of cells from anybody, and then we culture them in dish and then give uh, different factors, uh, in general four factors, push all the way back to a cell just like uh, embryonic stem cell. And then you can develop from these cells to any type of cells, more than 200 type of cells in our body from this so-called induced pluripotent stem cell. So that give us uh, a way to study a disease like Alzheimer's disease in, in culture in, in a petri dish instead of doing you know, in humans, sometimes it's hard to do it. Secondly, this type of uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cell derived neurons in culture can help us screen for drugs because uh, you probably hear many issues in the field now. Um, many uh, drugs test in, in animal models like in mice. Finally, when you go to the clinic trial, it failed. Uh, so there are many issues there. So the, one of the uh, problems is we don't have human neurons. Now, we do have this type of human neuron in culture. We can test the drug before we send the drugs to the clinic trial. And lastly, it's also very important, is to explore the possibility to treat a disease with a stem cell, so-called stem cell therapy. So we are exploring all three areas of this. So that's two you know, major areas in my lab for the research, you know, the, the, the pathogenesis of why people get Alzheimer's disease. Can we develop drug on this, uh, in parallel use uh, stem cell biology to uh, uh, model the disease in dish, the screen drugs, and hopefully someday we can even use stem cell for therapy. That's great. And I think um, one thing too is um, I have to make a, a quick plug for the Exploratorium's uh, stem cell exhibit, which is in the East Gallery. Actually, that was done um, in collaboration with one of your colleagues at the Gladstone, Bruce Conklin. So I, I believe that's the only live stem cell, it's mouse stem cell. Um, 
uh, the only live stem cell exhibit, I believe, in the world for visitors. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. If you find another, let me know. I've been saying this for years. Um, but we're, again, it's, it's uh, wonderful to have support from um, an institution like the Gladstone. And um, after you know, I, I met with um, Yadong and Sandy, I started fantasizing about getting my hands on some of those human neurons for the Exploratorium someday soon. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, so to, yeah. definitely I can say we'll send some human neurons here, you know, including this, some image of some uh, real cell, but you know, the human neuron can only survive in culture yeah. for a few weeks, but it will be very, very exciting, exciting to, to share those. That's great. And you know, um, you know, all of you know, oh, go ahead, Sandy. Do you want to take questions as you go? Um, I think the plan was to take questions at the end. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Um, I think um, all of you know that diseases like Alzheimer's are um, incredibly complex and that there are no easy answers. I know most of us in this room have probably been um, impacted in some way by um, diseases such as cancer or Alzheimer's. And understanding the complexity of science and basic research is something that um, practitioners like Sandy and Yudong know all too well. Could, could you speak a little bit about what you think the role of a place like the Exploratorium is in helping the public understand truly the endeavor of basic research and how how, how challenging it is to find real answers in treatments. You want me to take that? Sure. Uh, well, let me offer my welcome to everyone too. Um, relevant to today's gathering, I have I want to express three deeply held beliefs, and then I'll answer Christina's question. Uh, the first deeply held belief is that I love Exploratorium. Uh, everything about it is just first rate. So I'm proud to represent Exploratorium from my, uh, on the board and to do everything that we can to advance its, uh, it, its important mission. The second deeply held belief I have, and this is where Exploratorium takes the lead, is I believe that decision makers in our society uh, whether they're captains of industry and in government and philanthropy, need to be fluent in science. And in the current era, fluent in life science. We, we are emerging into a, a period where the technologies that Yadong and people like him are creating are gonna have such immense power, they're gonna present tremendous societal challenges of how to regulate these things, what, what, how to afford them. And so I think the mission that the Exploratorium has to bring knowledge, appreciation, love for science out to people who will not themselves be scientists necessarily is really important. But, but the third deeply held belief is that many of the biggest problems that face us as a society and as a world will not be solved by any solution other than advances in life science technology. And Alzheimer's, I think, takes the lead for that. A trillion dollar cost to our economy by 2050, that's $8,000 per man, woman, and child in the U.S. simply to pay for nursing homes and, and other direct expenses of Alzheimer's disease alone if there's no therapy. So the human cost is devastating, the societal cost is immense, and without new technologies, we'll, we'll all bear that burden. Um, but back to where uh, science is headed, we have gaps in knowledge of two types now, I believe, and some examples of Yadong's research will illustrate how we think about it. One, we have an incomplete understanding of why a cell becomes the cell it is. Uh, all the cells of our bodies have the same genes in them, with a few exceptions, um, but a brain cell becomes a brain cell and not a heart cell because some of those genes are switched on and others are switched off. And we only have a rudimentary understanding of, of how cells decide to be what they are. We've gained enough control of that to do some fancy tricks uh, that are quite spectacular, but not enough understanding to turn this into medically useful technologies yet. The other type of knowledge gap we have is why cells become diseased. Uh, Alzheimer's is immensely complex. There are dozens, maybe even hundreds of possibilities of what goes wrong, and likely all of them are true. There are probably a hundred or more causes of Alzheimer's when you get down into the molecules that are, that are based there. Um, but Yadong's work, and I hope he'll talk about his APOE work uh, first, perhaps, 
uh, shows you a good example of how we're understanding the, the mechanisms of disease and how to interdict them. The other side of the equation where Yadong has been a leader too is how you, how does a cell know to be the right kind of brain cell? He's figured out some of that. He can take skin cells and in a single step turn them into neural stem cells, a cell that can become any type of brain cell. He's going to show you some dazzling pictures in a minute, I hope, too. So knowledge of cell fate and knowledge of the molecular drivers of disease. That's the knowledge gap that we have, um, and that's what we work on. So Yudong, with that, with that teaser, would you like to show us some of your <laughs> images and movies? Right. So um, I'll, I'll share a, a short movie and then a few images we collect uh, based on... Um, um, before I show that, let me just... Uh, very briefly, because this is uh, about uh, mostly on the stem cell part, um, I'll give very briefly just a uh, um, half minutes or so about the, you know, the, the whole history of the stem cell biology development. Uh, um, and then probably we should start from uh, about 1958. That was the, actually it was the first the stem cell technology developed before even we know the stem cell uh, well, well. That was the, the so-called nuclear transfer technology was uh, uh, started by um, uh, sign, a British scientist, uh, his name is uh, John Gurdy. And he actually developed a nuclear transfer to generate the first cloned, actually, uh, um, tadpole uh, in, in his laboratory. So basically he has this uh, uh, fertilized egg and then he removed the nuclear and then take the nuclear from a skin uh, cells from the frog and then trans back to this uh, fertilized egg and they develop to a new frog. The frog is different from the original um, uh, uh, embryonic derived, but it's uh, similar or identical to this, uh, the, the frog that donated the uh, skin cells. That was the first time this so-called nuclear transfer technology was built. That was in 1958. And then three years later, 1961, that was actually the first time two uh, um, Canadian scientists you know, found there are stem cells truly present even in the adult humans or, or uh, animals. And uh, 20 years later, 81, um, was the first uh, isolation of the mouse embryonic stem cell. Uh, it was uh, three scientists in well, one is actually in USSF, two from, um, uh, again, from uh, England. The, for the first time, isolate mouse embryonic stem cell can culture them in dish. That really opened the study, um, the way you can study the stem cells. And then everybody from know that by 1996, that was the first cloned, you know, the dolly the sheep. Um, that was, again, used the so-called nuclear transfer technology. Um, by uh, two years later, 98, um, um, James um, Thompson from Wisconsin, you know, he, isolate for the first time the human embryonic stem cell. Now, for the first time, the laboratory can culture human embryonic stem cell to do some study. But after that, there are huge, you know, debate uh, on conversation. Can we use or can we, you know, cannot use? There has been about many years uh, um, issues there. So in general, there's a lot of restriction on using the human embryonic stem cell to do the research until 2006, that was a big biology, you know, not only stem cell, basically in this uh, biology field, big breakthrough, that was the reprogram. Uh, Shinya Yamanaka, he was trained as postdoc at Glaston, now he's a faculty at a, uh, a part, at least in Glaston. And he, in two, year 2006, he, for the first time, only introduced four factors, now we all call Yamanaka factors, uh, four different genes into, uh, uh, mouse skin cells, and in two months later, he generated these uh, embryonic stem cell-like cells in dish. So this cell has a full capacity to generate any type of cells in our body in general. It's about more than 210 type of cells. So that was a really, truly a big uh, breakthrough, not only for stem cell technology, but also in general, in the concept, you know, you can actually 
fully turn, uh, fully developed cell all the way back to the uh, embryonic stem cell. And he, one year later, he also developed the same technology by using human cells. So the skin cell can, human skin cell can be reprogrammed into um, uh, embryonic stem cell like uh, she call, uh, he called uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. Since then, has many labs, including my own laboratory at Glaston, tried to further tone this, you know, the so-called cellular reprogram. Um, now we can do, um, you know, reprogram the human skin cells directly to neurons, directly to neural stem cells, directly to heart cells, direct, directly to liver cells, and uh, um, pancreatic you know, uh, um, insulin secreting cells. So basically he opened a door so many uh, um, scientists can follow his studies, just do a lot more. So I stop here, try to show one very simple, um, While it's getting a movie on, I'll just make the comment that another way to think about what our colleague Shinya uh, started is that if you came to Gladstone today, we could take a little pinch of your skin, and in a matter of days to weeks, we could have growing in dishes, heart cells, brain cells, liver cells that are fully human, and they're not only fully human, they're you. They're genetically identical to you. In principle, we don't do this in humans, but it's been done in mice. We could take your skin cell and create your twin, uh, genetically identical to you, uh, a whole organism. We don't do that in people, but, uh, <laughs> but we do it in mice. Uh, so that's the power of this technology. And then where do we go with that to make this useful to society is the question. Okay, so let, let me just share this uh, short mode with you. So basically what you see here those the uh, you know traditional developmental biology, uh, traditional developmental biology uh, taught us. So these are the stem cell. These stem cell just this the hill. There's many valleys there. The stem cell will you know like a ball will roll down to different valleys. These different valleys just represent different type of cells. In general, this. So in general, those stem cells will roll down to, the, to be different cells. The general concept, this cell never can come back, but Shin and Yamanaka changed the concept by introducing, in fact, push back those skin cells back to the stem cell. Now you can imagine they can make more other, any type of cells in, in, in our body. So this is a truly a breakthrough in the biology field. And then like uh, uh, Sandy just said, now we can take skin cells from anybody uh, you know, in this room and then even currently this technology, even a high school student, you know, I have some, some interns, they do the uh, you know, one or two months, uh, some intern in my lab, they can take these human skin cells, culture them, give four different factors, and then they generate I, uh, IPL cells. So they were so excited about, you know, before they finish the, the, the summer intern, they saw the true stem cell under microscope, they can generate neurons. So, um, so now, you can imagine oh. whether we always need the cell all the way back to this position. The answer is no, you don't need that way now. After Shinya's work, now many labs at Glassone, we actually can put different factors, turn these skin cells directly into heart cell, to the blood cells, or to the brain cells. So that way, we avoid this long time you know, uh, culture, and at the same time, we don't, sometimes we only need the brain cells in order to study like Alzheimer's disease. So thus now we can do in, in my laboratory and in other uh, uh, labs now. Does not move forward. <coughs>
So Jeffrey's coming with some. Hmm? The bottom. The bottom? Yeah. Okay. So this is what I just showed you. You can take four factors, push them back to IPL cell to make all those three different types of brain cells. Um, at the same time, recent years, people can do, make the skin cells directly make them to neurons. But the problem here is that those neurons cannot be proliferate, cannot be keep going in the dish. You can only one round use it and, and you need to make a new one. So ideally, actually, if you, we can make the neural stem cell, instead make this IPL cell, this neural stem cell only make three types of brain cells, including neurons, astrocyte, and oligodendrocyte. And now we can do by only use one factor. Some other laboratory use you know, three, four, five factors. At Glassstone, we use just one factor we call SOX2, plus very unique culture conditions. We can push these skin cells to be neural stem cells, and these neural stem cells can generate all these brain cells. We can study the disease models in a dish or screen for, uh, for, the, for the drug. This is an example. These are skin cells. In culture, what the skin cell look like? and then these are the stem cells. This is one clone of stem cell. Two months later, this is stem cell generated from these uh, um, uh, skin cells. And then, of course, we can develop these cells to be a brain cell, one type of brain cells we call neurons. This is a cluster of uh, hundreds of neurons. They send all this process away to connect with the other type of neurons in, in, in the culture dish. And then at the same time, like I said, we are doing direct conversion of the skin cells to uh, uh, neural stem cells. And then this is one of the example from these skin cells, we can make uh, neurons, as shown here. We can make other types of the astrocyte called the supporting cells in the brain. We can also make oligodendrocyte, that's the cells, make this uh, uh, myelin sheet to protect this neuron process. So all three types of cells can be made from this originally derived cells from the skin. That's really powerful and fascinating. And one, one thing, too, in our earlier conversation that we had um, offline, um, you talked a bit about isogenic controls and how this technology allows you to really um, get at the gold standard of science, which is a, a clean negative control. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that? It's very exciting. Yeah. You know, um, like Sandy mentioned uh, uh, early on, you know, when you look at the different people, there's all the variations. The disease is complicated. You know, there is a Alzheimer's disease. Three patients may have somewhat different cause, somewhat different pathology there. So in order to generate those human neurons from all three patients and compare them with the other three or four control individuals, um, you will deal always with these variations. So when you see a difference in a, a human neurons, for example, generated from disease uh, from patient compared to normal individual. There's some difference. The question is whether this difference is truly caused by some gene mutation or some disease causing uh, uh, gene, or it's just the variation from person to person. So it's uh, so hard only rely on three cell, four cell from patient, other four from, uh, uh, from uh, control individuals. But the field has been advanced, so now we have cutting edge technology to deal with that we call uh, gene editing. So basically what we can do is we generate this human IPL cell from a patient, let's, let's say a patient with a mutation like apple protein E4, which I'm studying in our lab, is a, is a, is a great, greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. It's, uh, um, uh, where a uh, mutant form of APOE, it unfortunately is uh, not rare. It's 25% uh, in normal population. Basically in this room, one in four individuals carries at least one copy of this mutation. That mutation increased five-fold risk to develop Alzheimer's disease in, for women and, and two-fold for men. If anyone has two copies, which counts for 2% of normal populations, uh, in this room, on average, about one person has this uh, two copies of this mutation. The risk to develop Alzheimer's disease will be about 15-fold. So it's a huge increase. When we generate these human neurons with this mutation, compared to normal, we face this variation issue. So in order to really 
do um, some work to go to the very end um, for to do the gene editing. Let's say we have iPSL. They have um, um, E4. That's the arginine 112 at this position here. So that makes the E4. This is the mutation increase 15 fold uh, uh, if you have two copies. Let's see we have these cells. In order to compare in a more meaningful way, what we can do is we design a, a DNA sequence, a tag with a nuclease. That's the cut, the, the, the nucleus with will cut the DNA, make a break. Whenever DNA has break, the cell try to replace or repair this uh, break. And that, when they do the repair, we can introduce a new sequence. This sequence is apple E3. It's a 16-112 at this position. When you have the DNA open, when we give enough, we call donor, and the cells try to replace this break, they will use the donor. The, the, the consequence will be this mutation will be replaced or repaired by the normal sequence. By doing this way, we generate uh, iPSL from originally from patient with the E4 mutation. Now, we edited the gene back to E3. So that's why we call gene editing. By doing that, we generate a pair of cells we call isogenic line because they share exact identical genetic background. All those billions of this DNA sequence are identical. The only difference is one has this arginine 112, one has a cysteine 112. Any difference between these two lines, we can very accurate, accurately to say that's caused by this mutation because all other place in the gene, they are identical. So this is the power combination of the stem cell biology with the gene editing, so that helped us a lot. Let me try to put this in perspective for things that we all should care about. Uh, why don't we have a drug that would delay the progression of Alzheimer's disease despite decades of trying and, and billions of dollars spent? Why don't we have that? One answer to that is that it's very hard to do. Uh, the, the brain and biology is so complex, it's just a difficult problem. But I think there's been um, uh, a more technical problem. We haven't had the right tools to find the drugs that work. And, and think about it this way. If we want to find a drug that would delay Alzheimer's disease, we have to study that in, in mice or we have to study it in very strange kinds of human cells that aren't anything like uh, a, a real human brain cell until recently. But recently there have been new technologies, some of them less than two years old, that we're now converging. And what we can do today is both create authentic human brain cells that really do mirror the processes of the real brain, and we can study them with much greater power by doing this technique that Yadong described. I, I think you could see, when you're trying to learn what's different about an Alzheimer's brain cell versus a normal brain cell, and you're having to compare the brain cells derived from two people, every one of us differs in about a million places in our genome. There are a million differences in every human being on average. And so there's just a lot of noise. It's hard to figure out what really is going on with that kind of variation. Here, we can now have a brain cell in this dish and a brain cell in the next dish that differ in only one nucleotide base out of the three billion, and that's the one that we most believe, that we most, most want to understand. This is unprecedented. And this opens the door, we think, to faster, more predictable approaches to drug discovery and testing the drugs that you need in ways that just could never be done before until we give them to human beings. And every drug for Alzheimer's that's been tested up to now has failed. This is a new game. It's a new ball game now. And plus, if you think, you know, uh, in the future, is any possibility to do stem cell therapy, let's say, we take skin cell from a patient, grow the neurons. You don't want to transplant back 
the cells with the mutation back to the brains because the cells still die later on. So this is the way actually before you transplant, you correct the mutation and then you send back, they will survive better. That's really um, fantastic work, and, and I hope, I, I was just wowed when I um, had my first conversations with Yadong and Sandy about this. And clearly this kind of work takes um, enormous dedication and creativity and innovation, and that's, you know, so at the Explore term, we always try to inspire our audiences to, um, you know, if not pursue lives of research scientists, to at least become um, familiar and supportive of the ideas of science. And I wanted to ask you, Dong, if you can talk a little bit about, for those who may be inspired to pursue a life of science, um, what is it like? What is, how do you um, nurture creativity? You have a huge lab with lots of young, brilliant minds. How do you keep them motivated, and, and what keeps you or your postdocs up at night? Right, that's very good, a very important question. I've been, you know, thinking about this every day, because uh, um, at Glass on each lab, on average, probably, around 10 uh, people in the lab, like my own laboratory currently is 15 people in the lab. There are one third about a graduate student, they are pursuing their PhD degrees, there are about five uh, uh, postdoc fellows after they finish the PhD training. There are also about five or six are uh, we call research associate, basically they are supporting people in the lab. So how to, you know, make this lab more productive and collaborative and to do this uh, uh, really outstanding science. Um, so the, the, the innovation, the creativity, I think is a key in the lab. That drives all the new findings. Um, I always talk with a student, you know, um, don't, you know, uh, uh, to be afraid to fill some studies and don't to be you know, worrying about you design some studies, you, you didn't get the result you want, but you see some strange result. And then I always say, you know, many of those very exciting uh, uh, findings may not be by design, may not be com coming from you design, you see it, but actually many of the most exciting innovative result come from actually undesigned, like this uh, Shinya's work is it, clearly uh, uh, change the concept, the field, because it used to be, we believe, the cell will never make skin cells, they never can come back. So those kind of a dogma for the student, for young people, shouldn't be fair to, you know, um, challenge whether this is truly right or not right. Whenever you see in the experiment uh, result, it's different from, from what you think. Um, don't think it's wrong, maybe it's actually right, it's what we just don't understand now. The comment I'd make is I think it's the joy of discovery that attracts and keeps the young scientists we have in the game, uh, which is, of course, what Exploratorium is all about. It's uh, Exploratorium's not here for people to come in and just see something and remember it. The experience is designed for people to discover while they're here. and. Um, that's sort of embedded in the wiring of our nervous systems. There's a flood of pleasure that comes when you learn something new or you, you see an insight. And th that's what happens when adults or, or, or kids come here. The ones who really grow addicted to that end up at Gladstone. Um, uh, and I, I'll never forget that myself. I, I was a doctor before, I, I became a doctor before I became a scientist. I, originally went into this field for that reason. But then I got into a laboratory and I do an experiment and I knew that I'd put this experiment into an analytical device at night and I'd come back the next morning and I'd know. I couldn't wait to get back and see whether, you know, what had happened. Was, was the band of DNA here or was it here? And if it was here, that was bad. That meant my idea was wrong. But if it was here, oh man, uh, that was just great. I'd be jumping up and down. Uh, and uh, Now, often the band would be here and you'd study it even more and you realize that something was wrong. It, it, it was, it, the system was fooling us in some way. That happens more often than you'd like to think. But after you've done it three or four times, after you've tested another way, if it's right, uh, it's really addictive to get this kind of rush of discovery. That's 
what goes on out here every day, thousands of times, I think. I'd like to hope. So I think this is a, a great time to segue to questions from the audience. So um, there's a fourth mic um, that will be passed around. Uh, so fire away. Thank you. It sounds as if you've thoroughly absorbed Frank's <coughs> feeling that uh, you learn more from your mistakes than you would think. Um, question about the uh, difficulty of finding neurons to, to work with. Does this mean you no longer need things like the uh, UCSF brain bank? Um, the answer to that is, uh, is, is no. It's uh, basically we need both because the, the, the iPL cell you generate from human skin cell help you to culture in the dish to study the mechanisms, to test the drugs. But on the other hand, you always want to know, compared to what is going on in human brains, for example. Those brain bank is very, very helpful. I'll give you one example. We just published one paper about a tau mutation that causes uh, frontal temporal dementia. And uh, interestingly, um, you know, it's not clear why tau mutation causes this. So when we generate this human IPS and make neuron in culture, we observe this uh, in the cleavage, you know, this, uh, this long protein get chopped into small piece of this tau. We think this might be the cause because we didn't see uh, previously. We only seen this human neuron culture. But the question is, is this true? It, could we see this also in human, this brain bank, human brains? And then we contact the UCSF uh, uh, clinic um, uh, and get these uh, uh, three human uh, um, brain tissues and we analyze it, we see exactly the same fragment generated in the brains. Now we see it's very, very likely this small fragment, this piece of the protein generated from this mutant tau is likely part of the cause for this disease. This brain bank is really, really helpful. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with you, Dong, entirely. We have to have both. We have to have these powerful experimental systems in the laboratory, and they're very versatile because we can control things. We can ask specific questions, and we can know with much greater certainty whether the, 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 the hypothesis we have about causation of disease is true or not. But knowing it's true in the cell in a dish does not necessarily mean it's true in the real human brain. We can't do anywhere near the sophistication of experiments, but we still have to go back and do the best we can with, with the authentic human brain samples. I have a question for you guys. So, um, you know, knowing, knowing the Exploratorium as you do and, and knowing the, the challenges of um, representing your work to pu the public, what, are, are there particular aspects of your work that, that you would, that you fantasize about seeing um, talked about at the Exploratorium or brought into a public realm so that, um, you know, the, the American taxpayer who supports your work can, can really get behind it? Or where do you think there's misunderstanding um, in the type of work that you do that we can help elucidate? Um, I think a fundamental misunderstanding uh, is to equate life science with um, aerodynamics. Um, when, when we as a society decided to send humans to the moon, it took a decade and billions of dollars and enormous ingenuity and brilliance of engineers to create the moon flight and do that. But all of the principles of how to do that were known. You had to put them together in, in unique and creative ways to do it. It's not a trivial uh, undertaking. But all the, all the principles were known. That's what's different about biology. We don't know the principles. Yes, we can turn a skin cell into an embryonic stem cell or a brain cell, but we don't really know how it works yet. We only have a glimmer. Um, and the complexity of a single cell, even a bacterial cell, even a single bacterial cell is so complex compared to the most complicated machine that it just boggles the mind. And what, what amazes me uh, in, in the few decades I've been uh, in life science is how every few years 
we learn something new that's just radical. It just changes the whole way we think about things. The stem cell revolution is one of those. Nobody thought that once a cell became a, stem, a skin cell, it could ever be turned back into something else. That, that was just, it just didn't, nature didn't work that way. Uh, and it doesn't in, on its own. But we got a little glimmer of understanding, and so we can do it. But if what we need to know to really solve these major health problems is this, we're probably operating way down here now. And, and I think it's, I'd hope that all of you would welcome conversation about molecular biology at your dinner table. Um, it's fun, you know. Uh, I'll come and help if you like. Uh, I. I uh, I, I give a talk sometimes that I call, would you invite a mitochondrion to dinner? Uh, <laughs> and the answer is, if I'm at a dinner party and I start talking about mitochondria or DNA, my wife will kick me under the table. <laughs> but it shouldn't be that way. Uh, we should welcome conversation about molecular biology in the same light that you'd welcome conversation about impressionist art. Uh, uh, it, it ought not to be delegated to a few science nerds working down at Gladstone. Uh, so that's what I'd hope the Exploratorium could do, is make people comfortable and familiar uh, with the concept of, uh, you know, what genes are and, and what, how cells decide what to do or not. Um, knowledge of that is going to change the world. Um, I, I like to equate the current state of life science with the state of information technology in about 1965. Um, I learned how to computer program computers just to get a summer job back then when computers were the size of trucks and you know you fed them with punch cards and the data came out on little spooled papers with pins in the side. And I, I, I never imagined that you know, this device in my pocket would have a million times more power. But I worked for IBM, and neither did IBM, actually. Uh, IBM almost got blown out of the water by what happened in Silicon Valley. I think we're on the threshold of a similar, you know, kind of explosive miracle in life science. And, and I want that to happen in the Bay Area uh, with all the great institutions we have around here. And some of that's going to happen from folks like this. Um, I, I definitely agree on this. I'll just uh, add, you know, on top of that is, you know, an organization like this can, because uh, we are doing the, the scientific work in the lab. We need new blood coming, you know. Those exciting work, we need new students, new postdocs try to continue work on this, you know, contribute. And this organization can for sure help to, you know, to teach this uh, uh, public audience to see, you know, what exciting science, biology, stem cell work, and that can lead to more and more people getting interest, especially the young people getting into the field to support this kind of research. It's like eating oysters. Nobody naive could look at an oyster and want to eat it. But, but once you acquire a taste, uh, it's the same thing with molecular biology, you know. Uh, I'll show you how to learn how to enjoy that oyster. And to continue the, the kitchen analogy, my, my fantasy, along um, with dovetails with Sandy, is, is to really turn the Exploratorium um, in our new home into the front porch, so to speak, for um, emerging biology in the Bay Area. I think we have um, the facilities now in the life sciences to be able to do that. We have the relations um, to be able to do that. And I think we have um, you know, great thinkers, both on staff and amongst our scientific friends, to make that a reality. There's only one other place in the world that rivals the Bay Area as a dense concentration of some of the smartest, best life scientists, uh, and that's the Boston-Cambridge area. Uh, they are our competitor uh, in that sense, but we have a, a secret weapon in Exploratorium, I think, uh, to help this area become recognized as the dominant place where this revolution is going to come. Silicon Valley did it, and now it's the life scientist's turn. But it, it, we want it here and not in Boston. <laughs> Actually, um, Cindy organized a symposium in Gladstone just a, a week or two weeks ago, tried to learn from those Silicon Valley, those you know, information-related revolution 
technology revolution to see how can apply that kind of uh, approach to biology to make next breakthrough in biology. So I, I think uh, this uh, you know, organization definitely can help on that part. Yes, another question over here? Gladstone is also doing work on Parkinson's disease. I've got a dinner party for you. Well, yes, we are. Uh, just like Alzheimer's disease, there is no drug available today that slows the progression of Parkinson's disease. There are drugs that can relieve some of the symptoms for a while, but the decline uh, seems to proceed. So. We desperately need so-called disease-modifying therapies for, for Parkinson's as well as frontotemporal dementia, all the spectrum of diseases in which the brain degenerates. Uh, I call it the scariest thing out there in medicine, um, the most rapidly expanding and the area where uh, solutions have proven the hardest to achieve. But we, we have... Uh, uh, three folks like Yadong who concentrate on Parkinson's disease. And they made the IPL cell from those uh, Parkinson's yeah. disease patient skin cells. They study in the dish for the drug test. Yeah, we can watch a brain cell under the microscope develop Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease in a dish. We can grow it when it's young and see it look pretty normal, and then we can watch it go bad over time. This is new. You couldn't do this until a few months ago, really. And that gives us this tool now to understand why is it going bad. Because in the dish, we can ask all kinds of questions in ways it's just not possible in, in any other system. Question over here at the table? So given that you have these absolutely incredible tools, what do you see as the timetable before there is a therapy for Alzheimer's? And what happens along that timetable? Is it sort of just a process that you could show a roadmap to, or is there a lot of luck in hitting the one thing that works? So let me try to do this. Um, I think there are two major parts for Alzheimer's disease treatment. One is still the traditional small molecule compound treatment. There have been, you probably hear, uh, has been terribly filling uh, um, uh, clinical trial for the past five or 10 years. But now, the landscape start to change. And then, um, I think we talked, you know, another, uh, before this, it's just, uh, the, the Alzheimer's disease is a complicated disease. And the, 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 the target for the past uh, few years has been focused on one of these uh, potential target. All the drug uh, focus on one. So now, you know, all the big pharmaceutical company and also this academic institution realize this. Now we start to um, really separate or, you know, um, put effort on not only one target, but multiple different targets. For example, one target we are working heavily in Glastone is this apple lipopro uh, lipoprotein E4 genes I just showed you. Um, because this one mutation change the conformation, the structure of this protein making it a, 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 a toxic. So now we have the small molecule we call structure corrector, basically bind to the E4, change the structure, making it more like E3, this normal form of the protein. So hopefully uh, uh, the candidate drug will go to the clinical trial in two to three years. Uh, there are many uh, uh, other uh, uh, potential compound in the um, uh, on pipeline now. Basically, the point I try to make is uh, instead of target, target only one uh, um, drug target, but we should um, do multiple target drug development. And secondly, if the question relates to stem cell therapy, there has been uh, uh, many years to go. But I will share with you some very exciting uh, data we did in actually in mouse models. I was hoping he was going to say this. Yeah. So what, what we do is now, um, it turns out in, in Alzheimer's disease mouse models we developed with this E4 um, uh, gene, human E4 gene, put into the mouse. So you make the humanized E4 mouse. 
These mice do develop a learning memory deficit by about 15, 16 months, which is uh, roughly equals to about 60, 65 years old human uh, age. And they, they do develop the, the learning memory deficit. There was uh, one particular type of neuron die in the presence of this gene they call inhibitor neuron. In our brains, roughly about 85, 90%, they are they call exciter neuron. Whenever a signal come in, this neuron will fire. But you cannot keep firing, you need some control. That's the rule of this inhibitor neuron. Just like you drive a car, um, uh, you need some, uh, you need a brake. You, you cannot just keep you know, going, you need to stop at some stage. This inhibitor neuron just try to control this activity. Cool this other neuron down, it's roughly about 10%, control those 90%. It turns out this E4 protein kill many of those uh, inhibitor neurons. So that, cause brain we call overexcitation, we could bring overly active. Um, now, one way we can do is, is make drug just to protect those inhibitor neurons. But sometimes for the patient, they already developed the disease to some extent, the cell already died, you cannot easily protect it. Now the only way it seems is to replace it. Now what we are doing in the lab is uh, use the mouse cells in the from embryonic mouse, if we collect these uh, progenitor cells, those cells will generate later on the inhibitor neuron. We transplant those inhibitor neuron progenitor into this very small area in the brain which is responsible for learning memory where those inhibitor neuron die in the presence E4, and we transplant, let's say, 40 to 60,000 these uh, inhibitor neuron progenitor cells, and we'll wait three or four months and about 2%, small portion of that, do survive. Those cells are integrated, connect to other neurons to control the brain activity. You can measure the brain inhibition go up, the activity go down. And now, if you measure the learning memory of these uh, Alzheimer models, actually the learning memory come back to normal level. So basically, we would say we have the proof of concept by transplanting mouse cells to mouse brains, we can correct this uh, Alzheimer mouse, not at this state, not human. But that gives the possibility if we, in the future, might be possible, we generate this IPL cell from patient skin cells and then change the E4 to E3 and then make them to be uh, inhibitor neuron before transplant and then transplant to those. Uh, uh, human uh, uh, patient brains and hopefully it will work. But of course a lot of yeah. study need to be done. Uh, back to your original question, you'll never get a scientist to say three years. Uh, it, we, we all know how unpredictable it is, but I think um, what's exciting to me about Yadong's work is he has both developed a drug candidate that blocks the bad effect of this bad gene, E4. As he said, one-fourth of us have at least one copy of that bad gene. And about 60 to 70 percent of people who have Alzheimer's disease will have one, at least one copy of this. So it's the far and away the most powerful genetic predictor of Alzheimer's disease. In a mouse, he can give this drug and block the bad effect. We're raising money now to start a company to put this into clinical trials. It could be in humans in two years if all goes well. And if it works, you know, five years, we'd, we'd have an answer. Mother Nature is not very kind, though, and uh, we can't just rest there. So he has a cell-based therapy. Uh, this is one of those things. I would have thought it was crazy to think you could fix memory by injecting a few cells into the brain, because human brain has 100 billion neurons, and every one of those neurons makes, on average, 2,000 connections, so it's immensely complicated. And the notion of squirting a few cells in there and having it have an effect, it, at first seems preposterous, but by carefully identifying the specific kind of cell and knowing exactly the small part of the brain in which to put that, a very small number of cells is producing a dramatic effect. Now this is further away from trying in humans, but it shows there's another route. And if you then multiply what Yadong is doing several fold based on what other neuroscientists at Gladstone are doing, we have, I'd say, 15 or 16 candidate ideas of how you'd block 
Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, each of which is moving along on that timetable. Where I think this is all going to end up is treating Alzheimer's is going to be more analogous to treating high blood pressure than other than taking an antibiotic to cure your you know your your pneumonia. Uh, in that there's going to be so many different things that go wrong. One thing is not likely to fix the whole problem. It's going to take two or three, and it's going to be a different two or three in every patient. That's where most of us think the field is headed, and it's going to take a while, but we want to go faster. <laughs> So um, aside from the complexity of the, um, the field, what's holding you back from going faster? What, what, what do you need? Is it, is it, is it resources? Is it, um, I, I, I was going to ask about political will. My sense of it is that the controversy, political and social controversy about embryonic stem cells that was so important some years ago seems to be receding or becoming yeah. irrelevant. Right? Our friend Shenya's work removed the moral hazard because you'd never have to touch a human embryo to make a human embryonic stem cell now. You can do it in, in DISH. So that's not a problem. Um, I think the limiting factors, I'd point to two, uh, three actually. One is government funding for research. The National Institutes of Health have reduced in real dollars the funding for medical research every year since 2004. So while other countries are increasing their expenditure on medical research, our country has gone backwards for a decade, and that's a problem. The second reason is that private capital has sought greener pastures than life science, particularly neuroscience. So many drugs have failed. Why would you invest in a new Alzheimer's drug when you can go invest in a, in a, you know, in a new uh, social media startup and get a much faster return on investment with much risk. So there's been a flight of private capital. The nonprofits like Gladstone have to de-risk the field for the real investors. And for that, we either need government money or philanthropic money. And uh, that's in short supply. The third factor is overly inhibitory regulatory climate at the FDA. They need to give us more room to get promising drugs into humans in an experimental basis sooner. Uh, the bar is so high that it, one, that pushes the investors away because it seems so remote to, to get a return. And I think we could do that very safely if the right kind of rules were put in place. Great. In the meantime, it sounds like um, the holy grail would be if you could find some mouse venture capitalists to, who... <laughs> We can fix those mice, I tell you. We can make them smarter. In fact, if you read The Economist today, you can read about another Gladstone work where they actually made mice smarter. Uh, and not only the mice with Alzheimer's, they got smarter, but the normal mice got smarter. Uh, so it's a gene called Clotho that we've been working on. So uh, He pretty much asked my question, but I'll ask a different version of it. You, you mentioned someone asked if you still need access to the brain banks. Uh, even though you can create brain cells, um, are the are the, being able to push a gene back upstream into an embryonic condition is the quality as good as if you had access to embryonic cells directly? And have the and I'm not up to date on this. Are have the laws changed since the Bush years on the prohibitions of having access to embryonic cells? I think, uh, you know, uh, deeply different roles because the cell culture, you get this uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cell, you get neurons, uh, like uh, Sandy said, you can, you know, take time, follow up on the change in the culture and test drug at a different time point, you can do that. But um, the, 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 the issue there could be actually when you culture neurons, you take away the environment, you know, other type of cells, the, the vessels in the, uh, in the brain, and all other combined can change this local uh, condition. So when you go to back to the brain bank, the, the, the human tissues, they are all there. So, so they play different roles. So, so that's why we need both. We need study the culture cells, and then we need to get a confirmation from the human brain bank studies, and vice versa. Yeah, remember the brain banks are dead. These are dead cells. They're 
preserve tissues. So they're very useful to study, but you can't do, do anything with them. Back to your last question, the Bush era prohibitions on the use of human embryonic stem cells are still in place. You cannot use NIH money or even do work in the same building that has NIH money except with a few uh, approved lines that all have their limitations. So we still have that prohibition in the U.S. that's not present elsewhere. But frankly, the quality of the cells that you can now produce using reprogramming techniques uh, makes them functionally identical. Uh, you'll read every now and then, uh, you'll see a critic appear that says they're not really the same. And they're not, depending on how they're made. But with tighter quality controls of the reproducibility of how you make them, uh, I think I believe, and most people in the field believe now, we, what we're producing is really authentic. Can I just ask kind of a very basic question, more in line with the school teacher mentality about how best to think about students being able to make that gap from just throwing sand on a dish to actually looking at something through a microscope and understanding what they're seeing. Is, microscopes seem to have gotten a lot less expensive. Um, is there a threshold where, if you have a certain power of microscope, um, where you really can engage uh, a young student in a whole level of understanding that they might not have? Yeah, I think this is a very important uh, point. And we, I, like I mentioned, we do need this new blood, new people coming. Uh, Glass have been trying to do, you know, um, partner with our local high school. I'm teaching the high school uh, stem cell class every year. Each year I teach it three or four times. I bring my talk and, and sometimes invite students come to Glassstone, look at the microscope. Actually, in order to see the stem cell, you, you don't need a very fancy microscope. The, the basic level, the lowest level uh, microscope, you see it. Um, and then the beating heart, cells, so you can see it. It's a beautiful neuron, so you can see it. Um, by doing this for the past two or three years or so, I start to see it's, it's a really, I think it's a, it's a combination of the school and this educational institution like, you know, this organization here, like Glassstone, team together, help those high school or middle school students to understand. I always feel very excited when you show this to the student. Uh, I can recall, you know, the one, the first class I gave, the, you know, the student, you would not sit there, you know, they were talking to each other, they don't know what they are, I'm talking about. And then, until three classes, I received email questions, so many questions asked, and then by the end of that year, I invite three students back to the summer intern in my lab. They all now go to the college, the, at least one, you know, made clear that he wanted to do the Alzheimer's disease research. So I'm so, you know, excited about this. And I think also that, um, I'm glad you mentioned microscopes and you're dear to my heart. We have, um, we're lucky enough at the Exploratorium to have a, a fairly um, advanced microscopy facility um, installed in the East Gallery. And actually, um, part of the reason we did that was to give people this, this visceral, beautiful, um, remove the barriers to having access to things like live stem cells or neurons or zebrafish embryos. And so um, as an educational leader, we've thought deeply about how do we remove the barriers? How do we make it accessible? Um, what are the, the entry points? Not everyone needs to start at stem cells. Maybe looking at something out of the pond is a good place to start. And I think, um, adapting research grade instruments so that the public can use them um, is a great and wonderful thing to do. Um, also our teacher institute um, has a suite of microscopes and, and we work on low cost ways um, to explore the microscopic. I think anything, a great entry point for even little kids is just ma anything magnified is stunning. And so you go from, um, you know, pond things to, you know, and then you, you work your way up. Um, the next thing you know, you're a postdoc um, in your dog's <laughs> lab. <laughs> Spending late nights in the microscopy suite and loving it. I remember um, about 10 years ago, I was invited by my college uh, classmates to give a talk uh, in New York to some fellow classmates. Every year, somebody does this. And I, I remember reflecting on what I was going to say, and, and I had to 
reveal to my college friends that I actually would rather look at a plate of bacteria under the microscope than play golf. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't that I did you it see? out of duty. It was actually more fun. Uh, so that's what happens. You get addicted to this stuff. So, so with that, I'd like to um, invite you to give um, Yadong and Sandy a round of applause and thank them for their time. <laughs> Turn it over to Nancy. Okay. Well, thank you so very much. That was truly fascinating. Thank you, uh, Sandy, for uh, helping us organize this and conceive of the program. Thank you, Dr. Huang, for coming to join us today. It was a great honor to have you here with us. And thank you, Christina. I don't know about you all, but I certainly did not have a high school biology teacher of that caliber. Um, <laughs> as I recall, the priest I had was not half as fascinating or distinguished. So um, I can only imagine what a thrill it is for your students to um, be able to, to, uh, to learn with you and to see you in action. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, this is uh, an event that we will have annually. It's a special perk that is specifically for our Catalyst donors, and we were able to have some of our Oppenheimer Circle donors join us as well this year. Um, and it's a, in one of a series of ongoing events that we have every year that are specifically designed for our donors. Um, we are fortunate today to have the co-chairs of our Catalyst Circle here with us. Vince Ricci is here with his wife, Jean, and Ravin Averwal is also here with us, and so we're very, very pleased to have them um, join us as well. And I would ask you to please see any one of the development staff um, here in the room uh, after the program, should you have any other questions for us. And uh, just again, wanted to have a round of applause here for our very fine presenters. Thank you. Hey. I'd like to add my personal thanks, too, to all of you who write checks to Exploratorium. Keep, keep writing them and make them bigger. 